Big show coming up tonight. A uh, lot to get to this hour. One of, the, one of the weirder stories in today's news is the revelation that Jared Kushner, uh, the president's 36-year-old son-in-law, is in Baghdad today. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State has not been to Baghdad since the new administration started, but Jared's there. Um, that said, it's not totally clear what the Secretary of State does in this new administration. I mean, take the president's special envoy for Middle East peace. That is a person who has been appointed to be the Trump administration's eyes and ears, their point person on Middle East peace. That person does not report to either the president or the secretary of state. That person reports to Jared. The New York Times and the Financial Times report in detail today that the preparations for the critical meeting this week with President Xi of China, those preparations are also being led by Jared. Jared has also been put in charge of relations with China more broadly, in including preparing for this presidential meeting. He has been put in charge of U.S. relations with Canada and U.S. relations with Mexico, including building the wall. He has been put in charge of all trade deals. The Washington Post reported last week that he is now in charge of, quote, reimagining the Veterans Administration. He's also been put in charge of solving the opioid crisis and national broadband policy and criminal justice reform and the rebuilding of the nation's infrastructure. Young Mr. Kushner also apparently sits in on National Security Council principals meetings when it comes time to discuss the nuclear threat from North Korea. And now today, Baghdad. Busy young man. Hopefully he was adequately prepared for all these enormous responsibilities by his vast life and work experience, which consists entirely of him inheriting his father's real estate business. He also did have to run the business himself for a time while his dad was in prison. But he now has this remarkable, remarkable portfolio, maybe an unprecedented portfolio of both international and domestic responsibilities within the administration. And, th and that portfolio is made all the more remarkable by the fact that we now know that his wife, the president's daughter, will also be getting a senior White House job. We don't know exactly what her portfolio will be, but we know she's already sitting in on many of the most high profile visits by foreign leaders to the United States. Between her and her husband, Jared, their experience and expertise in the world lies in the fields of real estate and jewelry marketing. But the two of them now will be in charge of some of the most important and sensitive stuff in the government of the richest and most powerful nation on earth. Incidentally, I should mention, we also learned a couple of days ago that the administration has now found a new job as well for Laura Trump. Who? Laura Lara is Eric's wife. The Trump re-election campaign already exists as a formal political entity. The firm that runs the digital side of that campaign will now employ Lara, Eric Trump's wife. I have no idea what her work experience is, but I'm quite sure she's the absolute best qualified person in America for that job, <laughs> whatever that job is. I mean, in the past, we've had like, you know, a first lady who worked on health policy. Once we had a president who hired his brother as attorney general. But we have come to think of even those things as exceptions to the rule. We have never thought of ourselves as a country where like <laughs> Uday and Kuse get to be ministers of whatever they want, right? <laughs> we don't think of ourselves as a ruling family kind of place, but now, now that's what we are. And here is a rude consequence of that for our new ruling family. This remarkable consolidation of power in the hands of a few underqualified family members. Today, that became not just a remarkable story about the Uzbekistanization <laughs> of American politics. Um, today, that, and no offense meant to Uzbekistan, sorry. But beyond that becoming just a remarkable thing in its own. Today, this new thing that we've got as a country, this consolidation of American government power in the nuclear family of the president, today that potentially started to become a liability for the administration and for the government in terms of the most serious scandal that looms over the new administration. This is FCI Elkton. Uh, FCI stands for Federal Correctional Institution. It's a low security federal prison in Lisbon, Ohio. It's a prison for men. There are about 2,000 male prisoners there. This weekend, 
that particular prison, FCI Elkton, released a Russian spy. Hmm. Technically, his release date was not supposed to be till the end of July, but they let him out on Friday with time off for good behavior. Uh, now, that said, this Russian spy was not released back into the community at large. When he got sprung from federal prison on Friday, the federal prison system released him to Immigration and Customs Authorities because as part of his plea deal when he got sentenced last year, <clears throat> he agreed that after he served his federal prison sentence, he would immediately agree that they would deport him back to Russia. This guy who was just sprung from prison is now being deported back to Russia. His name is Yevgeny Buryakov. Yevgeny Buryakov. When the FBI busted the spy ring that he was part of a couple years ago in 2015, there were three alleged spies who were named in the criminal indictment. The indictment was brought by Prosecutor Preet Bharara's office in the Southern District of New York. Funny how his name keeps coming up. Uh, but Yevgeny Buryakov was one of the three people named in this ring. He's the one they caught. They arrested him January 2015 at a supermarket in Riverdale, New York. But the other two spies who were named in the indictment, they never caught them. Because by the time they brought those charges, the other two guys in this spy ring had fled back to Russia already. One of them had been employed as a trade representative for the Russian Federation in the United States. Uh, the other one had been an attache at the Russian mission at the United Nations. Um, but the th and they both went back to Moscow. They, they, they both escaped being arrested by the FBI. But this guy, the third guy who actually got caught, this guy who, who, who's been in prison until this weekend, this guy who they actually nailed, he didn't have an official government cover job like the other two did. They were all named in the indictment. The other two had cover jobs working for the Russian government. His cover job was a non-official cover. His cover job was that he worked at a bank. He was an employee of a Russian bank called VEB. He was the number two official at the New York office of VEB. And when he was arrested and charged with being a spy and put on trial, his ostensible employers, this Russian bank, they paid for his legal defense. And that wasn't all they paid for. On the day that he got arrested at that supermarket in Riverdale, his wife and his two kids reportedly fled their home and went to the Residentura. They fled to the building that houses the Russian mission in New York. Associates of Evgeny Buryakov then reportedly ransacked the apartment the family had lived in. Evgeny is in FBI custody. The wife and kids have gone to the Russian mission. Associates of Buryakov tore the apartment apart, sliced up all the furniture, smashed up the wallboard, broke the place apart. Apparently, they were looking for anything that Evgeny Buryakov might have left behind, or maybe any listening devices that the FBI might have hidden in his family apartment. Apparently, the FBI had put both cameras and microphones all over the family apartment. But by the time his associates were tearing the place apart looking for them, the FBI had reportedly taken them all back. And this is like amazing spy movie stuff, right? But think about the practicalities of it. What if you were the guy who rented that family that apartment? <laughs> you can imagine how Evgeny Buryakov's landlord felt about the state of that apartment when he found out that, okay, his tenant's going to prison, the rest of his tenant's family has fled, and now he's got this huge literal mess on his hands, the furniture and the wallboard and everything all smashed up and torn apart. Well, once again, the bank came to the rescue. In addition to financing Evgeny Buryakov's legal defense, the bank reportedly settled with the landlord for about $45,000 to cover the cost of the damage done to that house when Evgeny's friends tore the place apart after he got arrested by the FBI and charged with being a spy. And Evgeny Buryakov and all the stories of how he handed off intel to the other Russian spies who were in this ring with him and the drama of his arrest and his family fleeing in the dead of night into the Residentura and the bugs that the FBI had placed all over his house. All of this stuff has been fascinating color for one of the more lurid Russian spy scandals of the past few years. But that bank and that spy scandal are turning out to be a very pesky asterisk that keeps getting affixed to lots of things about the new Trump administration. Because that bank where Evgeny Buryakov was secretly working as a Russian spy, that, that is a state-run Russian bank. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev uh, is on the supervisory board of that bank. 
the chairman of that bank started his career by going to KGB school, <laughs> by going to the college that Russia operates for people who are going to join the successor agency to the KGB. Um, that, that FSB trained chairman of the bank was handpicked to be chairman of that bank by Vladimir Putin himself last year. That bank, for a million reasons, should have a flashing red light when it comes to worries about Russian intelligence and Russian influence operations here in the United States, right? And after all, it is a matter of public record that that bank harbored and defended a high-level spy who was working there as cover and then paid for his defense and even paid for cleaning up his apartment after they tore it apart looking for the FBI bugs. That's why it was astonishing news a week ago today when the New York Times reported that Jared... Jared Kushner had not disclosed a meeting that he took during the presidential transition with the chairman of that bank, with the Putin handpicked FSB trained chairman of the spy bank, who apparently met in person with Jared Kushner in December. Jared Kushner never disclosed that meeting, despite all of the other troubles that have plagued this young administration about their undisclosed contacts with Russian officials. For whatever reason, Jared Kushner did not disclose that meeting until it was reported in the New York Times a week ago today. And you know, that alone is sort of problematic enough, right, when it comes to someone with the kind of portfolio, with the broad ranging domestic and international portfolio that Jared has been assigned by his father in law in the new administration. Troubling enough. But now BuzzFeed News adds their new scoop tonight. As I mentioned, this spy ring they got busted by the fbi it was three russian guys one guy who had what they call non-official cover who ostensibly worked at this bank the other two guys though their cover jobs were official russian government positions one of them worked as a trade representative for russia one of them worked at the russian mission to the u.n when it came time for these guys to feed their secrets and stolen documents and intel from their spy ring back to moscow what would happen is these two guys who had official cover they would take care of that part of it. Not the, guy, not the guy who worked at the bank, because he ostensibly had no relationship with the Russian government. But the other guys who had official cover, the other guys who had Russian government jobs, they, whenever they had anything to transmit home, they would go to the residentura, they would go to the Russian equivalent of like a skiff, a secure facility, where they could make secret encrypted transmissions of information back to Moscow Center, back to spy headquarters in Russia. And the way the FBI caught them and blew apart this spy ring with these three guys was absolutely genius. The FBI arranged to have somebody feed these guys supposedly sensitive stolen documents. And, and they handed these documents over in binders. And these Russian guys, these spies, they took the binders with this juicy intel. They took the binders into the residentura, into the skiff in New York, and the FBI had hidden microphones inside the binders. And so they got to listen to everything these guys said, even when these guys thought they were in the most secure environment and couldn't be surveilled no matter what. Inside the Russian mission, they thought they were essentially diplomatically on Russian soil. They certainly had diplomatic immunity. They were in a Russian space. They thought they were in a secret environment. But the documents that they had sitting in front of them, the documents themselves were bugged. There were microphones in the binders. And so the FBI got hours and hours and hours of tape off those microphones and the binders of these guys talking when they were quite sure nobody could hear them. And one of the things those guys talked about was the other guy in their spy ring who worked in the bank. That's how they got him. Another thing these guys talked about were their repeated efforts to recruit Americans for their spying efforts. And when this case broke open in 2015 and they released the indictment, a lot of the news coverage at the time was about the fact that these spies apparently wanted to target college girls in New York uh, to be Russian assets. And that had kind of a nice tabloid appeal to it, even though the indictment didn't indicate that they had too much real success with the college girls effort. Where they did have some success was with mail number one. I'm going to quote from uh, the indictment here. Quote, on or about April 8th, 2013, the defendants discussed efforts to recruit a male working as a consultant in New York City as an intelligence source. 
Now, what I'm going to quote you here is a conversation between the two Russian spies, the guys who, who, who got charged but never went to prison because they had already fled back to Moscow by the time their compatriot got arrested at that supermarket. So this is the two guys who are now back in Moscow who never got arrested. This was them speaking at the Residentura, having no idea that they're being surveilled. They're speaking to each other in Russian. And then this is, this is the FBI translation of what they said. So spy number one says, male one, that's the name they give the guy in the indictment, male one, wrote that he's sorry. He went to Moscow and forgot to check his inbox, but he wants to meet when he gets back. I think he is an idiot and forgot who I am. Plus, he writes to me in Russian to practice the language. He flies to Moscow more often than I do. He got hooked on Gazprom, thinking that if they have a project, he could be rise up. Maybe he can. I do not know, but it's obvious he wants to earn lots of money. Spy number two says, without a doubt. And spy number one says, quote, he said they have a new project right now, new energy boom. He said it's about to take off. I do not say anything for now. The other spy then says, yeah, first we'll spend a couple of borrowed millions. And then the first spy laughs and then says this, quote, it's worth it. I like that he takes on everything. For now, his enthusiasm works for me. I also promised him a lot that I have connections in the trade representation, meaning you, that you could push contracts. I will feed him empty promises. And then the other spy, who is in fact working as a Russian trade representative, swears. He says, bleep, no, <laughs> then he'll write me. Or not even me, maybe he'll write to our clean one, meaning he will write to the trade representative's office and accidentally not talk to a spy. He might talk to a real trade rep. Wouldn't that be terrible for their recruitment efforts for this guy? The first spy then says, basically, don't worry about it. Quote, I did not say the trade representation. I did not even indicate that this is connected to a government agency. This is intelligence method to cheat. How else to work with foreigners? So this was a conversation surveilled by the FBI through their you know, magic microphone in the binders trick. That conversation happened in April 2013. They are talking about an American citizen. They're talking about recruiting an American asset for their spying. That happens in April. April goes by, May goes by. In June, the FBI decides to act. June 13th, that same year, the FBI went and paid that American guy a visit. Quote, on or about June 13th, 2013, Agent 2 and I interviewed Mail 1. Mail 1 stated that he first met the first Russian spy defendant in January 2013 at an energy symposium in New York City. During this initial meeting, defendant gave him his business card and two email addresses. Over the following months, Mail 1 and the defendant exchanged emails about the energy business and met in person on occasion, with Mail 1 providing the defendant with Mail 1's outlook on the current and future of the energy industry. Mail 1 also provided documents to the defendant about the energy business. So forget the college girls thing, which didn't really work out for them. This is what the Russian spies were after, right? This is, this is the start of how they cultivate Americans to betray the United States, right? Start off friendly. Start with a, a business relationship or maybe an academic relationship. Start off with, you know, could you just let us know your own thoughts on specific industries or specific things in the U.S. government? Maybe you could help us by showing us some documents from those industries. Let's stay in touch. Let's start a transactional relationship. Can I see what you've got, please? Yes, I'd love to see those documents. What else do you have? I'd like to see more of that kind of document. I mean, this is, this is how they do it, right? And maybe it turns into something, maybe it doesn't, but you cultivate assets. This, this is what they do. This is why they're here instead of working at home in Moscow. Well, BuzzFeed News reports tonight that Mail One, in that spy ring indictment, is the Trump campaign foreign policy advisor, Carter Page. He was recruited as an American asset by Russian spies in New York City in 2013. He was successfully recruited. He handed them documents and information to help them out and was enthusiastic about their relationship. That advisor, Carter Page, met with a Russian intelligence operative named Viktor Podobny, who was later charged by the US government alongside two others for acting as unregistered agents of a foreign government. It's from Ali Watkins' story at BuzzFeed tonight. Quote, a former campaign advisor for Donald Trump met with and passed documents to a Russian intelligence operative in New York City in 2013 
The advisor, Carter Page, met with a Russian intelligence operative named Viktor Podobny, who was later charged by the U.S. government alongside two others for acting as unregistered agents of a foreign government. Quote, a court filing by the U.S. government contains a transcript of a recorded conversation in which Podobny speaks with one of the other men busted in the spy ring, Igor Sporshev, about trying to recruit someone identified as Mail One. BuzzFeed News has confirmed that Mail One is Carter Page. Here's my favorite part. BuzzFeed News has confirmed. How did BuzzFeed News confirm that Carter Page is Mail One? Quoting from Ali Watkins' story, <laughs> quote, Carter Page confirmed to BuzzFeed News on Monday that he is Mail One <laughs> in the court filing and said he had been in contact with Podobny. So Jared's in Baghdad at the invitation of the Joint Chiefs, meeting with the troops, visiting U.S. Embassy personnel. There is nothing too sensitive for Jared to be involved in, let alone to be running in this new administration. He is leading U.S. preparations for the China meeting. He was apparently at the table for the decision on launching the Yemen raid that killed a Navy SEAL in addition to many civilians. He is in charge of all trade deals. At a very, very scary time in terms of North Korea's nuclear capabilities and intentions, Jared is apparently at the National Security Council principals meeting when it comes to North Korea. But at some point in coming days, he will have to make time in his incredibly busy schedule to testify to the Senate Intelligence Committee about why, during the presidential transition, he met with the FSB-trained official who Vladimir Putin hand-selected to lead a Russian state bank that is currently sanctioned by the U.S. government and that harbored a Russian spy network in this country that, among other things, recruited a Trump foreign policy advisor as a Russian intelligence asset just a few years ago. Amid all the worry and focus and scandal and investigations about the Russian attack on our election last year, and contact between the Trump campaign and Russian officials amid all that furor, Jared Kushner took that meeting in December with the guy from the Russian bank, and he never said a word about it until a newspaper reported it. BuzzFeed reporter Ali Watkins, who's the one who unmasked the Trump foreign policy advisor at the center of this Russian spy story. Ali Watkins joins us next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.